So what we're going to talk about today is actually querying of event streams. How many of you put out events today in some way? Maybe you know this guy and some of the stuff he's doing. Maybe you're using this. Maybe you're just pushing everything through queues. But you probably have a lot of events in your system. How many of you save your events and query them? There's a ton of value inside of them. And there's certain queries you can do off of events that you can't easily do in any other model. So what we're going to talk about today, we've been making, I'd like to call it a cross-pollination, but it's quite likely this guy as well. Over the last year and a half, we've been building a query language specifically for querying over event streams. And it's not a new concept. There have been people that have done this in the past. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to take a complex event processing system and look at it historically as well. And it works out well because you end up with one model about whether we're talking about right now or whether we're talking about a year ago. It doesn't really make a difference. And I know complex event processing is the new big thing, and it's the old big thing as well. One of the main things that's going to force us to focus on is time. Time is really important in a lot of these kinds of queries. In particular, what we're looking for is what's known as a temporal correlation query. Ideally, we should also be able to get real-time information out of these kinds of systems, or I should say near real-time. And I mentioned this is not new. Has anybody seen this before? It's from a stream database. I personally don't like this model. The reason I don't like this model is it's basically taking events that are happening at points in time, and it's trying to convert them into SQL. I find that when people use this, they start losing what the underlying mental model really is. Now, it is a nice declarative language. It's strongly typed. But people, it's, it's basically made so that people can start thinking about event streams and pretending that they're actually SQL and tables. Now, this is all going to come back into event sourcing. The concept of event sourcing is we rebuild our state by replaying events. And all that we store is events. Every single event that happens in your system is always stored. And I've been talking about this for a long time. This is actually the second time I talked about event sourcing. And this was in, what, 2007. This talk was actually horrific. So, actually, no, it was the one before it that was horrific. So, go to talk about event sourcing and domain-driven design. Come in. My front row is Eric Evans, Martin Fowler, and Gregor Hope. <laughs> I've never talked to any of them before. Go through my talk, and Eric comes to me afterwards, and he says, you know, that was a really bad talk. <laughs> Like, crap. So I came back a year later, and I did the talk again. He said, this time it was a really good talk. And just as a side note, this is back from 2006. And you'll notice we're talking about how we did 2,000 sustained transactions per second. Now I say it to people, and they're like, on what, your iPhone? You know, we were taking 30 gigabytes of data per day. And that was big data back then. Now it's not so big. But I've been talking about this idea of event sourcing for a long time, and most of you have probably actually heard about event sourcing at some point. What we are is a database. We're basically a database built for event sourcing. And that stuff's been solid for a year and a half. All of our effort has been going into this query model and how to then query off of your event store. Now, conceptually, and people have probably seen this slide before because I use it when I do event sourcing. So we have cart created, three items added, one item removed, and then shipping information added. We could store this as an event stream. At any given point in time, I can replay those events and hand you back a domain object that you could use. A lot of people are starting to get into this with Akadot persistence. And there's also some similar things coming into Erlang. Conceptually, our event stream starts at event zero and goes forward to whatever our current is. An example of this. I could be looking for a temporal correlation query. I want to know all the people who said the word Starbucks, then within three minutes said the word happy, and plus or minus five minutes said the word coffee. Why? Because I'm a Starbucks marketing person. 
These kinds of queries are hard to do in most systems. I'm basically looking for series of events that are temporally correlated. The problem with this is you end up having to build out specific models in order to be able to issue your query. Um, we actually built our query language for one particular query. Can you imagine building an entire database for a single query? So the query is actually in the medical industry. I, as a doctor, am looking for patients that were diagnosed with pancreatic cancer within the last two years. They were given chemotherapy with this mixture level based on, a, on their body weight. They were given their treatment no more than three times within a two-week period, and they failed with a lab result set that looked like this. How do you issue that in SQL? <laughs> select star from, uh, select star from, where in, select star from, where in, select star. You have to build a specific model to execute this query. It's the same query as this. Now, one benefit with this kind of querying is essentially you have a time machine. You can go backwards and forwards in time. At its core, you have an append-only immutable model. You can imagine a file that is just constantly appended to. Again, when we think about an event stream, we can conceptualize it being like this. Now, at its very core, we can say that an event is a function. It has a name, it has some parameters. Think about what an event looks like. It has some type and then some parameters. When I have a stream of events, what I actually have is a stream of function calls, function definitions. It's basically saying, item added, and then has an ID. What was that item? When we talk about wanting to do a query, what we're actually doing is we're defining the body of what those function calls actually mean. And there's an infinite number of ways you can define that body. At its core, each event is representing f of state being past the event, and it returns you a new state. If, for instance, we were to go back to this, where we have our cart created, three items added, one item removed, shipping information added. If I were to look at how this would actually look as function calls, and wow, that's cool, it ruined my formatting. So what we have here is we have created. Since created is the first thing, it gets past null. It doesn't have a previous state. Then the return value of created goes to item added. The return value of item added goes to item added. The return value of item added goes to item removed. If we had one more, the return value of item removed would go to shipping information added. Has anyone seen something that looks like this before? Except maybe it's properly formatted because it's running on my laptop, not his. This is known as a left fold. When we talk about event sourcing, we can always say that current state is a left fold of previous behaviors. Our entire query language is based around this particular concept. At its core, we can say that we have some function. Here, I'm passing null to created. I want maybe to not pass null, and we'll look at why I may not want to pass null as my initial state. So that I can generalize with a thing called init. Then I've got f1 and f2. Those are mapping back to my functions. And I've got this last thing on there, which is called filter, and we'll talk about filter. But at its core, our query language is focused on the generalization of this little function group. First thing that we'll get into, I need to be able to map events back to functions. And the easiest way to do this is a pattern match. Now, does anyone recognize this language that we have here? You guys have probably all used it before. It's called JavaScript. And we'll talk about why we chose to use JavaScript. But essentially, what I'm doing here is I'm mapping event one to a given function. I'm mapping event two to a given function. And event one and event two here are actually event types. So for this type of event, map it to this particular function. What this will give me is it will give me the, F, uh, sorry, the F1 and the F2 
matching as I go back through the event stream. But there's some special ones here. One of these is dollar sign init. Dollar sign init is the init function that we saw earlier. I may want, on my very before I get my first call, to initialize some state that will actually go into this. Another one that you can use here is dollar sign any. Dollar sign any will map this function to any event that you actually get up back on a stream. When we start having our pattern matching, the next thing that we're then going to need is we're going to need to be able to select events. So here we have from stream. From stream will take all the events in stream S and then allow you to fold over them. There's other operations that we're allowed to do. From streams. From streams, S1, S2, is the equivalent of a join. So take these two streams, give me back one stream with the events interleaved between them. Other examples is from all. From all will select all of the events in my system and allow me to fold over all the events in my system. And of course with this, you also have the ability to window. So for instance, I could say from stream foo, window only the last five minutes. So start from five minutes ago and come forward to now. All of these are returning back a stream. The result of your query is also a stream, which is quite useful, because you can start layering queries. I can have a query that runs, it results in a stream, and then I have another query that's querying over the stream that came back from the first query. Some other examples that we have here. From category C. And this is something that's new to us, and I've never seen anyone else actually have something like this. From category C will return me a stream of stream links. So for instance, let's say that I wanted to work inside of a bank, and we had a stream per account inside of the bank. I could go through and I could say from category account and it would give me back a stream filled with stream links that point to all of the accounts. Why is this useful? Well, what if I wanted to, inside of a bank, go through and say, I'm looking for a new type of fraud. Now, when I do this, I normally want to run each account separately, and it has its own state. And we'll talk more about this. Another example of this, and from category, is actually just a a specialization of streams matching. When I say streams matching, I give it a function. All the streams in the system are given to that function, and it selects whether or not you're interested in running on that particular stream. Where this becomes really powerful is when we start saying for each. For each allows me to basically map across all of these different streams. So you can imagine I've got 10,000 accounts inside of the system. For each says, I want to run this pattern match across every single one of those streams independently. And to be fair, map is probably a better name for that, but in testing with people, we came up with for each because there's a lot of .NET developers using this. Now, the big thing that we're getting into here is when we start saying that we've got five years worth of event history saved, it's very, very expensive to use a lot of the current systems that are out there. I mean, I could go through and I could write, let's say, an Akka, an actor that did all of my pattern matching for me. But that would require me to move all of my events to that actor. What happens when you have 10 terabytes of events? How many have heard of this thing called MapReduce from Google? It's basically the same problem, right? I don't want to have to move all of my events to my query. I want to be able to move my query to where my events actually live. And which do you think is going to be faster? Reading data off of a hard drive or putting data over a network? Well, today, if you compare Spindle versus network, actually, it's probably slower to get it off the hard drive. But the general idea is I want to move my query to where my events actually live. The whole language that we're going through, what it allows you to do, it allows you to take a query and to move it to where your events are. 
Everything else is just forms of how you select your events and how to go through and start building up your actual fold. But there's some other operations that are available. Two very important ones are emit and link to. Emit just takes a stream name and an event, and it writes an event out to an event stream. Up until now, we've been talking about pure querying. The ability to emit an event allows you to do any form of complex event processing that you want. The other one is link to. Link to is equivalent to an emit, but it's a special kind of emit. It emits a link to another event. And the last speaker, he was talking about, you know something's right when it gets so simple that you can't take anything else away. Link to is one of those things where it's a completely simple idea, but it's extraordinarily powerful. Link to is how all the indexes in the system actually end up being built. All of the indexes in the system are actually streams themselves. And when you build an index, you build an index by writing out your index actually in JavaScript. Let's take an example here. Let's imagine that I have a system of chat rooms. So here we have IT chat, we have C Sharp chat, and we have NNUG chat. And you can see in the first chat room, we've got Joe talking, John talking, then Dan talking, then John talking. In C Sharp chat, we have Paul talking, then John, then Dan, and then Dan. And in the NNUG chat, we have Paul, Paul, Joe, and Joe. There's only one problem. When people come and they ask us for a query, they ask us for a query based on user, not based on chat room. So we have partitioned our system into streams based on chat room, and then the question that we get is based on user. That would be a horrific query to write, correct? The reason it would be so horrific is because I'm going to have to look at all my events, regardless of chat room, in a totally serial fashion. This is where link to comes into play. So as you can see here, we're going through and we issue a link to. And we link to event.data.user. What we're doing when we do that is we're repartitioning all of our data. So what I'm going to end up with afterwards, I end up with new streams called chat-dan, chat-paul, chat-john, and chat-joe. What these contain is pointers back to the original events in the original chat room streams. But if you go to read the stream chat-dan, chat-dan will come back to you, and it will look just like a normal stream with all of Dan's chats inside of it. But you don't actually copy the events from one stream to another. It's a pointer that goes back to the original event. This is how all indexes actually get built up inside of our querying model. Once I have this, I can then query across my chat-dan, chat-paul streams, as opposed to querying back against the original chat room-based streams. This is a really, really powerful idea. Where this really comes into play is when I start combining this with the concept of for each, or map. When I say that I want to issue a for each, what I'm really saying is that I'm getting back a stream of stream links. And I want to do this fold across each one of those streams independently. So each one has its own independent state. That means it can be done in parallel. If I run this, because I'm doing from all, from all needs to be run in a serial fashion. From stream needs to be done in a serial fashion. When I have more than one stream, I can start saying I want to run in parallel across multiple streams. Combining this concept of linking allows you to be able to go through and to use for each as opposed to from all. When you use a for each query, we will automatically parallelize it for you. 
If you're running in a cluster, that includes distributing between multiple nodes inside of your cluster. Let's say, for instance, you're running a five-node cluster, and you're running four querying threads per node inside of that system. When you issue a for-each query, that's going to be running on 20 concurrent threads. If you run a from all, like this one, it's going to run on one thread. And it can be automatically paralyzed for you. Again, the reason I can automatically paralyze your query for you is because you're telling me that there is an independent state per stream. Now, if we go back, we can look at another type of query like this one, where I use state partitioned by. And I can pass a function to say how I want to actually partition my states across the streams. This is not paralyzable. The moment that you tell me that you have a state per stream, you're telling me that all of these queries are actually independent of each other. It's really important to remember that you should always be preferring to use for each because it's automatically paralyzable. The problem that we start running into, and this is where these kinds of indexes become important, is there's no way for me to query those chat rooms independently of each other. Someone's looking for the word happy, then the word Starbucks, and then the word coffee. But they're looking at it not based on uh, chat room, but based on user. It doesn't matter which room the user set it in. What this allows me to do is to basically bring up my streams that are now user-based, and then I can do a for each across them. Once you have built out this index, you'll always be able to do a for each across it. Now, where this really comes into play, I mentioned that query earlier from the medical industry. We were trying to do clinical data. How much data do they need, normally need to go through? That query looking for people needs to run across all the data in America. Imagine having all the medical records of everybody in America, and you're trying to find that needle in a haystack. This is where the for each comes into play. It's this ability to automatically paralyze queries. The indexing is really focused on trying to get us to the point that we can do for eaches. If you are running into queries that are serial, you normally try to combine this concept with the concept of indexing. Now, let's just go back really quick, because we actually do this ourselves internally. We have a query internally that creates indexes based on event type. You'll notice here we have event one being mapped to a function and event two being mapped to a function. Using this same idea, Instead of doing, let's say this was on a from all, could I automatically translate that query then to a from streams event one, event two? It's the same idea that we're using here. What it allows me to do is to basically go through and to convert your query from looking at all events to only looking at two streams. And we do this automatically for you internally. But these ideas are heavily, heavily composable. Now, one really important idea behind this query model is that when we talk about an event, an event is a verb in the past tense. If you guys happen to speak a Latin language, it's always in the composed past, it's never in the imperfect past. You would not, for instance, say batch job running. It's always batch job started, batch job completed. This becomes really important when we start talking about querying events. Does your query care whether this event happened one millisecond ago or five years ago? It works in the exact same way. Now, again, this brings us to our concept of being able to have a time machine. Now, any query that you run against a stream of events, you can not only say that this is the current result, you can also give what the result would have been at any point in time that your system has existed. I know that, that sounds weird. Let, let's try actually a, putting a business problem on top of this. I, as Amazon, have a new idea. I think if you remove items from your cart, within five minutes of checking out, you're more likely to buy that item in the future than the other things that we offer you. Why? 
Think about when you remove an item from your cart. Do you just randomly remove it five minutes before you check out? Or did you go look at your cart and it had like $300 worth of stuff in it and you're like, hmm, my wife will kill me. So I'm gonna remove these two books. Doesn't mean I don't want them. It means I'm, I'm putting them at a lower priority than the other things inside of my cart. So now, we go through and we write a query. I can actually write that query and tell you what that query would have told us if we had that query August 17th, 2013 at 1.35 in the afternoon. How? I only run the event stream through to that point in time. Again, this is something that Window can do for you. You can say, Window, beginning of time to August 17th at this time, and it will give you back your results. Now, one question we've had a lot, and this is really awful how badly it's messing up my slides. Why would we use JavaScript for this? How many of you would pick JavaScript as a querying language? <laughs> okay, not so many. We got a lot by using JavaScript, and we made a lot of trade-offs at the same time. One of the things we get, how many of you have had some of your code break before? Maybe it wasn't your code, a junior wrote it. <laughs> but there was some broken code. One of the beautiful things about the model that we've actually gone with, when you're even running, let's say, a map-reduced query, and it breaks somewhere in the cluster, it will stop, and then you can debug it. We have a very cool debugger. We spent a lot of time writing it. It's called Chrome. So you just come in, and basically your state, as it was running in the server, will come all the way back out into Chrome, and then you can debug it just sitting in a browser. Now, how can we do this? Let's go back really quick and take a quick look here. So, in this model, if I'm going to have a failure at some point inside of this model, I'm still purely functional. At any given point in time, my method call that I'm calling based on a pattern match, it takes ah, state and an event, and it returns state. So let's say that I get a problem inside of that method call. What would I need to bring back out to the browser in order to make it happen? Well, I would need to have the state and the event. Well, and of course, I'd need to have the JavaScript, but obviously we have the JavaScript. So when you get a broken query, what actually happens is it goes all the way back out to the browser with this is what the JavaScript was, this was the state at this point in the fold, and this was the event that was being processed. And then we set a breakpoint for it inside of it for you. So now you can just step right through inside of JavaScript. It was a really, really simple thing for us to be able to do. Let's jump forward. How many of you know JavaScript? How many junior developers know JavaScript? Now, I could give you some other language. I could have done it in Clojure. Clojure is actually a really nice language. How many juniors know Clojure? Do I really want to try to teach them Clojure in order to be able to get them to use this stuff? Part of where we've been trying to set this query language is that it's easy for people to use. Now, because we chose JavaScript, there are some downsides to this query language. Biggest one, this is not meant for algorithmic trading. We always have people ask us, so I can write my algorithmic trading system inside of JavaScript now. No, it's a really bad idea. We've made different trade-offs than I would make inside of an algorithmic trading system. One of our biggest trade-offs that we've actually made is we make all data durable before it actually hits JavaScript. If I'm building a high-performance system, this is not something I would want to do. We're focused more on, let's say, the bottom 98% of systems, not so much the top 2%. JavaScript is also quite bad in this regard because, obviously, it's a garbage-collected language. You will get pauses occasionally from V8, 
in terms of actually running your queries against it, especially when you flip to real time. And remember that any query, because it's just a fold, can always continue into the future. It's not just about running in the past. Again, we're focused more so on the bottom 98% than the top high-end systems. And we've made very, very different trade-offs compared to what you would do in the top 2% of the system. The largest single one is the fact that we make everything durable. That said, we also provide quite a bit for your JavaScript. The largest thing that we provide is we will make you high availability. You write JavaScript. We handle all the clustering of your JavaScript, moving from node to node in the case of failures, load balancing across nodes. That's all taken care of. When you write your JavaScript, if it's parallelizable, again, it will automatically go across the entire cluster. In general, we really need to get more functional programmers to understand more of these kinds of eventing concepts. It's not only for people working in languages like Erlang. Everything we've talked about has been purely functional. And it's an overall good model. Sometimes you actually do want to directly query back down to event streams. There are certain queries that you can do off of event streams that you can't do easily in any other database. The main ones are going to be temporal correlation queries. But temporal correlation queries can fit into an overall relatively simple model. Now, overall, I hope we have not created one of these. What we're really trying to do is bridge ideas from a couple different places. And we're trying to come up with new models and new ways of looking at this. Hopefully, what we've created is a nice cross-pollination between different systems. And with that, if anyone has any questions, Uh, it's uh, three BSD uh, open source. Sorry, three class BSD open source. Um, you can go over to github.com slash event store, and it's all there. Currently, there are native drivers for Erlang, for Akka, for .NET, and if you just happen to be on the JVM, there's a JVM wrapper. Hmm? Um, most of the people that are using it right now are using it for event sourcing. Uh, right now, a lot of finance and a lot of gambling, which kind of makes sense. <laughs> um, we, we've also slowly been breaking into the porn industry. So basically, all the leading indicators we've got, you know? Yes, so any time that you write a query, you can say, I want this query to run and stop when it gets too current, or you can say, I want this query to run and keep on running forever. So basically, your, your query will transition automatically between the two modes. Do we publish any benchmarks? Do we publish any benchmarks? They, they have been. Um, what kind of benchmarks are you interested in? Yep. Um, we, we do have benchmarks published on that. Um, I can tell you right now you're getting roughly 70 to 100,000 events per second in and out of JavaScript. Of course, it's going to depend on your machine, and it's going to depend on your version of V8. There's, there's a lot of ifs on that. Um, again, we are not built to be high performance. We are built to be simple. This is why we chose JavaScript. If I wanted to build something that was really, really high performance, I wouldn't have made any of the decisions we've made along the way. Um, certainly not doing it from JavaScript. It's actually quite similar. Um, Storm has a very, very similar model to what we're doing. Um, as you know, Storm's built on top of Hadoop. Um, 
we've basically gone all the way down to the, the transaction engine level in order to build this into the transactional engine. Um, another good example of something similar is Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra is a column store, and I could put inside my columns, I could put my events inside of the column, and then I could do a map reduce over all the column sets. The thing you can't do in Cassandra would be a from all with ordering between all of your event streams. This is actually a really, really expensive query to implement. Um, you actually have to do it all the way down to your transaction, engine le your transaction engine level. Most systems don't actually need it, but if you need it, and it's, it's quite easy to use if you're a smaller system, um, the ability to do a from all is quite valuable. And again, we're focused more on that end of the market than, let's say, the algorithmic trading side of the market. Is it better to store fat events or events with uh, uh, small volume? In general, you want smaller events. Um, normally, your events are actually going to align to your use cases. You generally do not want to have um, this field changed this field changed with one event type for every field in your system. It's generally going to be, for instance, um, customer moved location. And it's going to align back to your use cases. Would you include uh, redundant information like the name of the customer again in that? You can. Um, in general, I try to avoid that. And you don't need to have it because you have your state that's going through the fold. So, for instance, I could keep track of the current name of the customer inside of my state field. Uh, we, we, we support replication and w as well as sharding. Um, there, there is some level of overhead, in particular in writing, because when you consider this, so the way we work, we actually have a quorum model. So when you're actually writing, of course, we have to write to a, a, a quorum of nodes. So you're going to end up in network hits in terms of your writing. I mean, since you are storing events from the beginning of time, mm -hmm. isn't it going to explode um, space-wise? I mean, over time. So I get this question a lot. Um, and this is really more of an event sourcing question. So my question would be, where do you sit in terms of how much data you're pulling in? If I drew out an equation that represented your future data use, where does that sit relative to Moore's law? If you're over Moore's law, then let's start talking. If you're under, then you're just, your data is going to get cheaper and cheaper over time. Um, how many of you remember when a, a 10 megabyte hard drive cost $3,000? Today, if I told you we need to store 10 megabytes of data, I'm pretty sure none of you would worry about it. Any other questions? I have been working on that. Um, right now, I'm more focused on trying to get videos out, because it's a lot easier to get out three days' worth of videos than it is to get out 500 pages of text. Um, but as soon as I'm done with the videos, I will be going back towards writing. So, We've had this stuff in beta right now for about a year and a half. We are probably within the next two months going to say that it's actually production quality. Um, I'm guessing probably about two months. We have people currently using it in many places, but we don't want to call it out of beta yet. Any other questions? Uh, so right now, the back end is implemented in a few things. Um, obviously, JavaScript. Um, we also have C++ code, and we have C# -sharp code. However, the C# -sharp code's in the process of going away. Um, things are actually being rewritten in C, and then we're actually going to be using oddly Erlang on top of that. Oh yes, yes. Uh, our primary running environment is Linux. 
Um, we actually, for a lot of clients, we ship as an appliance running Linux. Any other questions? Well, then I will thank you guys for coming out, and hopefully we can all enjoy coffee. If you do have more questions, feel free to grab me during the day. Um, I should be around most of the day. Greg, thank you very much. Thank you.